Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Hunger Hunt Feast. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about your fasting insulin. Now, I'm sure many of you had blood tests, um, looking at your, you know, your lipids, uh, your blood sugar. We have fasted glucose. Uh, maybe you're an A1C, depending on where you went, or both. Um, maybe looking at triglycerides, of course, and, um, and cholesterol in general. But not a lot of people are familiar with fasting insulin. They don't. It's not on their blood test, or if it is, they're not. They're not looking at it. They're not paying attention to it. They're not talking about it with their doctor. Um, and it really, really is an earlier indicator of the development of insulin resistance and the loss of insulin sensitivity, which would eventually lead to those elevated A1C, elevated blood glucose levels, uh, elevated triglycerides. Um, those, those are all, you know, when those get elevated, you know, something's wrong. Um, and, but it's been wrong for a while. When, when your body cannot regulate the blood sugar and triglycerides, something's been wrong for a while. Um, and in many cases, it's the insulin, it's insulin resistance and an elevated level of insulin in your bloodstream, so hyperinsulinemia, it's called. Um, so fasting insulin, it would be a good thing to keep an eye on because we can look at the score. It's usually scored between, say, 1 and 25. It can go over 25. If it does, you're in, you're in trouble. Most people range somewhere between, you know, 3 and 20, let's say. Um, and I'll give you the scale and what that looks like, what that will, what, what's normal, what's that, um, you know, kind of warning zone and what's diabetic, so you know, or extremely insulin resistant. But, you know, we were talking about the development of metabolic syndrome or metabolic disease. And we're leading to, you know, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure. Um, you, you know, you, you've got all of these symptoms. Well, the five, the, the five markers of metabolic syndrome are a large waist circumference based on visceral fat. Okay. So not just if you're just built big, bigger than the average person. Um, it's waist circumference, large waist circumference based on belly fat or fat, generally speaking, that's visceral. It's below the muscle around the organs in that space where organs belong, right? Uh, high blood glucose, so we mentioned earlier, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, uh, and low HDL cholesterol. And if you have three out of five of those, you're in trouble you have metabolic syndrome. Uh, so three of the five, high or large waist circumference from visceral fat, high blood glucose, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL. Three of the five, you've got metabolic syndrome developing and you basically, you, you, you have metabolic syndrome, but it's, it's, and it's, it's never, okay. So that's not a stagnant disease. You're, it's either progressing or it's, you, you're reversing it based on your lifestyle, based on what you're doing, what you're eating, okay? Uh, but again, fasting insulin would give you an indicator of something moving in the wrong direction before you had elevated glucose, before you had, maybe before you had high blood pressure, or high triglycerides. Um, so again, insulin resistance is when we have an elevated level of blood sugar and triglycerides in our blood. Triglycerides being like what they also refer to as free fatty acids. So a triglyceride is a fat molecule. It's, it's basic three, three fatty acids held together by a glycerin molecule. So um, it's, it's how fat is transported and stored. Uh, well, transported in our bodies. Uh, the liver makes the triglycerides, puts them on an LDL particle, sends them to um, various parts of the body to either be used as fuel be burned as fuel or stored in a fat cell. And when stored as fat cell actually is broken apart and those fatty acids are stored individually. Um, but it's broken apart to get into the, the fat cell. Um, but, uh, you know, again, before our blood sugar is chronically elevated, where we see high blood glucose, not at just after a meal, but like where it stays elevated, um, the fasting insulin has begun to rise and it has been doing that for a while um, and you really want to catch it 
early. So if you get your fast insulin tested, uh, your ranges typically for, for normal would be like, they're, they're, sometimes they're measured in millimole. Most people, you're going to probably get them in what's called micro units. You get a little, little U, a big I, big U. So that's micro international units per milliliter. So three to eight is normal. Okay, normal fast insulin. Uh, eight to 12, you've got um, slight to moderate insulin resistance. I saw one scale, eight to 10, broke it down even more. Eight to 10 was like slight, 10 to 12, moderate insulin resistance. 12 and over, you're looking at severe insulin resistance. So you've got, you're, work, you're moving in the wrong direction. And we wanna get back down to those single digits, ideally eight or lower. Um, and insulin resistance is generally driven by the buildup of visceral fat. Once again, the fat in the abdomen, under the muscle, it builds up around the organs, starting with the liver. That's where insulin resistance starts. That's where fatty liver uh, begins. The, the buildup of visceral fat begins in the, with a fatty liver. Uh, usually that's from excess sugar, in most cases. Uh, alcohol can also do that. Not, you have alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease is usually driven by an excessive amount of fructose. Um, I guess that's where I'll get into that, but that's where fructose is primarily uh, processed, digested. And then, so that increases uh, your triglyceride production because your body's trying to, your liver's trying to get rid of that fat buildup and the extra energy that it can't use. And it, but it can only store as fat. So it Packages, packages them in triglycerides and sends them out in the LDL particles to be delivered again, to be burned for fuel or stored in fat cells. But as that fatty, uh, fat builds up, visceral fat builds up, it can move on to just that empty space and create just a larger waist circumference like we mentioned earlier, where it just starts filling in space below the muscle. Okay, so it's not that billowy stuff right under the skin. That's subcutaneous fat, like the fat on your your legs, your arms, uh, that might be kind of loose under the skin, you know, you can move it. Um, when you have visceral fat building up, usually the stomach can get, it can get kind of tight, it feels firm, but it's under that muscle. So you can't, you know, shake it, move it, <laughs> like we do with, um, when think of jiggly fat, it's not really what it is. Uh, but that fat again, builds up pancreas. So then you have problems with um, insulin levels, glucagon levels, we get um, you know, diabetic uh, symptoms. Uh, kidneys, you're gonna get high blood pressure. And on the heart, of course, you're gonna get the beginning, you know, the heart disease or heart failure. Um, that's one, one of the things, uh, but it's a buildup of, of fat because it just needs a place to store it. So, uh, so what causes the fatty liver or the insulin resistance? Well, it's, it's not really a chicken or egg situation. I mean, you, might, you can say which came first, but they actually drive each other. So maybe it is like a chicken egg thing, but um, you have, um, usually you start with a buildup of fat in the liver, which creates insulin, some, some insulin level of insulin resistance or, or basically a buildup of excess energy in the liver that doesn't know what to do with. Uh, it can store some of those fat, but often you start getting insulin resistance as part of the process of when it's trying to turn that fructose into uh, usable energy into ATP. So not to get too deep in that, but basically they drive each other as the liver gets fattier, you get more insulin resistance. If you, as you have more insulin resistance, the liver can get fattier and so do you get, get more visceral fat. So the visceral fat drives insulin resistance. Insulin resistance drives visceral fat. Terrible cycle, okay? Um, that's why I said it doesn't really stand still. It continues to progress or you do things to reverse it, which we will, we will get to but it's much more impactful than subcutaneous fat, just the fat under your skin. Um, subcutaneous fat on a large, when you have a lot of it, it can cause some problems, for sure some inflammatory problems, more, more inflammation, more, um, it can start get disease, subcutaneous fat can get disease and start overfilled, like you hit your fat, your fat quotient, or your fat quota, I should say, um, your fat limit that you can store in subcutaneous fat and it starts spilling over into the blood and then gets to, again, build up more visceral fat. But, but generally speaking, visceral fat per pound per pound, okay? So it's like three, four pounds of visceral fat can really do some, some havoc to your metabolic hormones. Four or five, three, four, five pounds of subcutaneous fat on your body, not a big deal. 
at all. It's, it's, it's normal, right? Um, it's actually very low, but visceral fat, you have that, that much fat in your visceral area, you're, you're going to have some um, problems with losing weight. You're going to have elevated insulin levels. Um, and you're, you know, you're not going to really see that unless you get a DEXA scan, but you can look at these numbers of fasted insulin to begin with, and then look at glucose and A1C and triglycerides and know, yeah, if that's the situation, you've probably got some fatty liver going on. You've got some insulin resistance. Um, and it's generally a result of, like I said, excess carbohydrates or it can be, um, there's actually a few ways you get there dietarily. Um, one of the biggest dietary fails we have, especially in, in the Western diet, fast food diet, uh, but generally Western, I mean, whether it's Europe and US, Canada, um, even South America, we have a lot of carbs and fats together. Australia, not only about Australia, you're down under, but you're still having a Western diet. Um, carbs and fats together. So like pizza, donuts, fries, chips, ice cream, any kind of fast food. You got a burger, okay, so it's got fat with a bun on it. That's fat and carbs together. French fries, obviously fried potatoes with these omega-6 oils they put in there, gross, right? Basically processed food. 70% of the American diet, generally speaking, not my diet, maybe not your diet, but general public processed food, which is made up of refined grains, okay? So ground up grains of some sort, soy, corn, wheat, right? Those are the biggest ones. Uh, sugar, oats, probably in there too oats, um, barley, but sugar, and then uh, seed oils. And sugar could be whether it's, you know, a corn syrup, table sugar, honey, uh, rice bran syrup, any kind of anything that says syrup, you can pretty much get it. It's, it's got sugar. Um, so anything with like fructose being a, a part attached to some form of glucose or something like that. Um, and then the seed oils or vegetable oils, as we call them, although I mean, yeah, technically corn is a vegetable. Um, wheat's, you know, uh, a grain, right? And we consider soy to be a grain, corn to be a grain. Um, and these oils are really pulled from things like, like rapeseed, uh, cotton seed. So we have cottonseed oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, things that you wouldn't think of as being sources of oil, right? Or fat necessarily in large degree, cotton seeds, the little seeds in cotton, soy, corn, um, fat coming from avocado or olives, which are fruit, by the way, um, or from a nut or true nut, you know, yeah, those are fatty foods. They can squeeze some oil out of them. Um, fat from an animal. We know all animals have fat, like lard, tallow, right? Duck fat, um, coconuts. Coconut fat, that seems perfectly normal. Canola, soy oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil. Yeah, not so much. Rice bran oil, rice bran. That has oil, that has fat. So these are really what we call industrial oils or vegetable oils that we've been told to. They're really waste products, they're byproducts, but they found that they could repackage them and sell them to Westerners as cooking something to cook with, right? Or and they use them as fillers in processed food. They were much they give it shelf stability, give it a little bit of flavor when they're taking out all the saturated fat, taking out the, the good fats, right? The cotton, the uh, coconut oil, and the, um, the naturally occurring animal fats that might might be in a in a food. Uh, oh, you know, salad dressings that say olive oil on the front may have a little bit of olive oil, but they they've really buffered it to make it cheaper with soybean oil. Um, so these, these oils, they're omega-6, they're inflammatory, okay? Olive oil and avocado oil or omega-9s, our bodies can make omega-9s, but they're not inflammatory. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. We have an overabundance of omega-6 to omega-3, right? That ratio needs to be more in balance. Uh, once upon a time, it was probably one to one or four to one. Now it's like 30 or 50 to one as far as omega-6s to omega uh, threes ratio, omega three is coming primarily from fish, right? Um, there's some present certainly in beef, grass fed beef. There's going to be some, um, an omega three that can be converted to ALA or 
uh, or excuse me, EPA or DHA. Uh, but th this magical combination of carbs and fat together, like I mentioned, it really triggers a dopamine response in our brain. It's very comforting. Okay, so think about in nature, not man-made, but nature, we're looking at breast milk, okay? Mother's milk, breast milk is a wonderful combination of fat and carbohydrates together, which made us feel good when we ate it, it made us want to come back for more. And it helped us grow, grow quickly. Our bodies were growing quickly. We need a lot of energy and it kept us nice and plump and happy uh, when we were in our, our greatest growth phase. Um, Acorns is another example of this in nature. Squirrels use them and other rodents use them to fatten up for winter. Great combination of carbs and fat together. Um, and that is the, the purpose of them. I mean, if you think about carbs and fat, uh, bears eating, you know, they get some fat from the fish they eat. And if most of the year, like in the spring, they go out and they start eating um, a lot of fish, right? But in the fall, Berries, so late summer, fall, berries come into bloom. They're waking up from a five or six month hibernation. Uh, in the spring, they're eating a lot of fish. They're getting, you know, but they've, okay. So they're getting ready in the winter. Their body knows it's getting ready to sleep again. What does it need to do? It needs to put fat back on so it can spend five or six months sleeping without moving, without eating, without doing anything. Lots of berries, honey, salmon. That's their diet. They plump up on it. Um, and, you know, again, we've talked about this before with, you know, birds, they'll eat, you know, uh, hummingbirds, they have a huge little tiny hummingbird 400 um, mile trek of, of uh, migration trek, where they don't stop 400 miles don't not stop little tiny bird, what do they do they fatten up they get fatty liver, they get insulin resistant, they gain like, you know, it's like they're like 40% fat. Okay. Um, to fly 400 miles on nonstop. Here's a problem with humans. Winter never comes and we don't have this long migration, right? Where we move a long distance without eating, heaven forbid, we can't get, you know, an hour down the road without stopping for something, right? Um, in a car. So uh, <laughs> winter used to be for humans, um, you know, maybe they had some nuts stored away that they had kept maybe or some dried fruit possibly, or canned fruit. But for the most part, if you go back far enough to, um, you know, when things were a little more primitive, um, was a lot of farming. They had to gather the berries. They weren't farming them. They were gathering berries, maybe finding some honey now and then, um, finding some nuts, maybe some fruit around, depending on where they lived, what part of the world they lived in. But meat was, they come out in the spring, none of that's available because it hasn't come into season. They're hunting, they're eating meat and the fat from the meat. And then summer, some of the, uh, uh, the berries and the fruit and the honey might become more available. And in the early fall, that can give them some fat to store up for winter when food was going to be scarce. Again, they might have, maybe they have a smokehouse or some cured meat, dried meat packed away to get them through the winter, but they certainly weren't living in abundance through the winter. What do we do through the winter? We celebrate holidays, we eat like the world is ending, <laughs> but, but that wasn't how, how it used to be when we had the fruit coming available seasonally. Now we've got fruit year round, right? We've got nuts year round. Um, so we don't have a food shortage. Therefore, we have a surplus of energy in our body. We have energy toxicity. And that's what the carbs and fat together kind of creates, creates the energy toxicity that creates that insulin resistance. And it causes us to put some fat on, not necessarily arms and legs, but in the visceral area, the visceral fat, which then, then adds to the insulin resistance, which allows us to put on more weight everywhere else. Um, and when you have a lot of a glucose or sugar and um, in, the, in the body with uh, fat at the same time, you have that energy toxicity that actually can kind of limit um, can limit the uptake of fat. First of all, you're not going to you're not going to burn. Well, it limits the uptake of the glucose. And some people have said that's that's a good thing. Oh, if you eat fat with your carbs, then you slow down the absorption. Mm, in the gut, maybe not, but in the bloodstream, 
Yeah, and that's not good because we want the sugar out of our bloodstream and into muscles and into tissues, right? If you're slowing the absorption of glucose from your bloodstream into muscles, you're going to have elevated blood sugar. When, now, the carbs are already there, so the insulin levels are high, right? And you have elevated blood sugar, it's going to stay high longer. Um, when insulin is elevated, so you have the carbs and fat together, let's, let's back up again, carbs and fat coming in, elevate, insulin is elevated, guess what you're not doing as well? You're not burning fat. So if you had just had fat and say meat, you have a minimal insulin bump, it's very short, stays low, uh, doesn't impede fat burning for very long, if at all, and you can still burn fat, but then the, the fat gets kind of used, burned, right? Moved and, and, and it continues flowing. Um, so it's very momentary. It's a short-term influx of calories, which gets moved through the system and either stored or used, you know, like protein put, taken where it's supposed to be. Um, fat burned can flow back and forth. When you have the carbs and the fat, you have elevated insulin, so you can't, you're not burning fat. Um, you can certainly be storing a lot of fat, but you're supposed to be trying to store or, or burn one of the energy sources, right? So most of it's going to be carbs, um, but with the fatty acids in there, a lot of fatty acids with the starch, not a little, not a moderate amount, but a lot of fatty, you know, a lot of fat and carbs together, you're going to limit your body's ability to also uptake that glucose. So we have, you know, high blood sugar, high free fatty acids in the blood, that is insulin resistance, that is metabolic disease. So you create it through your diet, we actually create the environment in what we eat every time we eat that type of food. Um, the other uh, big thing, another big thing I should say is sugar. Um, specifically, Fructose. Now, fructose is a major driver of fatty liver disease or fatty liver in general. Um, so, all fructose, okay, goes to, and I'm saying fructose without without fat being present. So let's just say a soda, okay, or candy, or you know something like that. Um, all fructose, fructose goes to the liver. Okay, so let's say you're eating just straight up sugar, which is half fructose, half glucose. Uh, maybe 20% of that glucose is going to go to the liver. The rest will be used in the muscles and the brain. Fructose, all of the fructose, pretty much going to the liver. So you got 20% of the glucose, all of the fructose, you got like you know, 60, 70% of that sugar going to right to the liver. Uh, liver can only handle about 150, 150 grams, 100 to 150 grams of glycogen as far as storing glycogen, 100 to 150 grams at one time, which again comes from glucose as well as the uh, which could be like a starch or a potato or something like that, bread. But coming from the fructose, is what, it's all of it. So 150 grams, that's not hard to hit. Many people who are eating carbs at a meal will eat that much in one meal. Um, especially with sugar, it just goes down so fast. You know, you figure 40 grams in a soda, it's not hard to hit. So <clears throat> the excess sugar is then converted to fat, as I mentioned. So you build up more fat in the liver, you get more visceral fat around the other organs, as I mentioned before, same process, send out as triglycerides and the LDL particles, you got elevated uh, triglycerides, elevated LDL, it's not the, the elevated LDL that you want, it's not the light fluffy LDL that can come from maybe eating just good you know, fats, animal fats. It's, it's a small dense LDL, which is carrying triglycerides. That's the kind that get kind of caught in the inflamed arteries, which high blood sugar, high insulin levels will cause inflammation in your arteries. So if it's, if it's just going up and down, like you had a meal and then it drops off like it's supposed to, it's fine. But when it remains elevated, because you got the high fat, high carb, high, you know, uh, combination or just an inflamed insulin resistant uh, situation where blood sugar stays high all the time because it can't manage it, insulin levels are elevated all the time, you're going to have inflamed bloodstream or blood vessels, the endothelial tissue of those blood vessels is going to be inflamed. Think about you scratch your hand uh, to the point that you can see red, right? So it's scabbing where it will scab. What happens? Your, your immune system goes to work and it gets a little sticky, a little tacky while it's healing it up, right? So it's got inflamed, very porous tissue. Everything sticks to. 
Uh, same thing in your arteries. Those little small cholesterol particles. Again, not likely the like the big like fluffy ones, right? The small dense ones are going to get often caught in those cracks and fissures through the process of the immune system trying to pack those up and and just just an inflamed tissue to begin with. So they get caught in it. They kind of get caught as like innocent bystanders. They're floating by and there's this inflamed area and they stick. And then they get all the blame. They get all the blame for the heart disease and the plaques when it's really the inflamed environment that has caused them to get stuck there to begin with. They're just floating through like they usually do. So um, it's, again, it's sugar. It's not eggs or beef causing this inflammation. If you're just eating, say, steak and eggs or you're eating you know, some kind of fish and you know, fatty fish like sardines or salmon and um, eating your egg, whole egg, your egg yolks and stuff like that, you're not gonna, it's not gonna create this insulin resistant inflamed environment. Um, so if you're trying to you know, lose weight, you've got to reverse insulin resistance. And that's gonna be very um, difficult without changing your diet, right? Uh, even modern fruit. So I know people say, well, fruit's a natural food. Fruit, tell me fruit's bad for me. Look, if you're eating, you're trying to lose weight and you're trying to reverse insulin resistance. The last thing you need is more fructose because your body already has too much of it. It's got, you got fatty liver. Yes, it's gonna go hit, hit your system a lot slower with fruit than it would from a soda or from processed food or sugar, but you still don't need it. It's not giving you any benefit, it's just adding more fructose to what you're trying to reverse. You're better off waiting because it will at the very least slow your weight loss, if not stop it, because it's just giving you the opposite of what you need which you already have too much of. And our modern fruit is not like what fruit was even a couple hundred years ago or back 400, 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. We've bred so many from corn, fruit, um, especially fruit, a lot of vegetables to become things that are much more starchy and much more sugary than they were in their natural state. Apples should be, you know, small, like like golf ball size or maybe slightly bigger. Now they're the size of a softball, you know? Um, that's all puffed up with sugar. So we, we can't look at fruit and say, oh, but it's, natural. It's, it's, it's not what it was once upon a time when we were healthy hunter-gatherers. Fruit has become a, a much a more, to make it more sellable, to make it move off the shelf a lot faster, make it more palatable, a much more, uh, a greater source of sugar than it ever uh, was originally. So not to get caught up too much on that, but you know, again, we've got beyond that a, a more common problem, refined carbs, like cereals, bread, pasta. So it doesn't matter if the box says whole grain on it. They've taken a whole grain and they've ground it to mush. And then they package it into something that looks like cereal, a Cheerio, bread, it's ground to flour or whatever, something, some substance, and then packaged into something. There's nothing whole left in it. There might be some fiber in it somewhere, but it's not a whole grain where you have a grain that's got a kernel around it and very small amount of starch, lots of fiber, okay? Where it takes a lot of work to get to that starch that's in the middle. Now it's been destroyed to the point the starch is, it's right there, it's available instantly. And I just uh, posted about this, Study, I mean, you, you guys have seen, I posted, you know, it, it, Cheerios has cholesterol. Now, you know, reduced health cholesterol because it's got oats in it, or it was on Quaker Oats for a long time. Heart healthy. Okay, guys, come on. It's, it's even, even with oatmeal, yeah, it kind of looks like an oat, but they've taken all of the hard shell kernel fiber off the outside of it. Even if that was beneficial, it really isn't. There's nothing magical about the fiber as far as preventing heart disease or doing anything special for your heart. It just slowed down the absorption of the carbohydrate. So it wasn't such a big carbohydrate load at one time. But now that they've taken that off there because people don't want to really crunch through their oatmeal or um, they want a nice sweet taste in their breakfast cereals or their bread, um, there's not really much fiber left in them and, or, to, or, to, or, or around them to protect them. If you're eating a whole quinoa or maybe you know rice that hasn't been over processed, 
yeah, it's a little slower absorption. You can probably get away with some of that if you're health, metabolically healthy. You're trying to reverse it, forget about it. But anyway, the study I was talking about, British Medical Journal, linking um, consumption of refined grains with heart disease. It was a huge study. It was like 137,000 people aged 35 to 70 years old, uh, t- over 21 different countries, different um, income levels in those countries from low, medium, and, and high income uh, countries. And none of the people had a history of heart disease, no previous history of heart disease. But they compared eating 50 grams of refined grains of any kind throughout the day or less to 350 grams of refined grains or more. So it's about seven servings. Now, there's a lot of people can still eat seven servings of refined grains easily. They're having a couple a bowl of cereal is probably two <laughs> uh, easily. They're having bread, sandwich, you know, pasta. They can hit seven pretty quickly. 350 grams. Oh, yeah. Especially in America, all right, or in uh, many Western European or Australia or Canada, you can yeah, easily they hit that. But this is what they compared: fifty grams to three hundred fifty grams, about seven servings, on the on the high end. Thirty-three percent, three hundred fifty grams, thirty-three percent more likely to have a severe cardiac event, cardiovascular event. So that could be stroke, heart disease, heart attack. So having a a severe event, not just disease, progressive disease, an event, 33% more likely to have an event, 27% increased risk of death, straight up death by any cause. So, hmm, refined grains, not so heart healthy. After all, it doesn't matter what lab created vitamins, minerals, and you know, fiber they want to count to put on there and how they mold it and what sunshiny thing they put on the front telling you how healthy it is um, or what agency they get to, they pay to put a little badge on there to make it heart healthy. Um, It's not heart healthy. It's not heart healthy. If 350 grams gets you 33% more likely to have a severe cardiac event and say you're eating half of that, you're still closer than you probably want to be to a cardiac event. Just guess it. Just guessing, as opposed to 50 grams or less. The little sneaks in, it's here, it's like a small serving now and then. Okay, it might sneak in there. Um, but certainly not something you should just write off saying, hey, it's heart healthy, I'll just eat all I want. No, no, it doesn't work that way. That's marketing. Let's look at science. Let's think a little bit. Um, so, you know, just pass on the heart healthy cocoa flavored Cheerios. Um, and, if, and if, you know, let's, let's take another example of, uh, I always compare, there was a China study, right? The veg, you know, vegetarian, they eat a lot of rice, but oh, they're, health, they're thinner, they're thinner than Americans. Yeah, they're thinner, thinner than Americans. Um, they have a, a lower, so uh, East Indians and Asians tend to have a lower, what's we'll called fat threshold, where they don't put on as much subcutaneous fat. That's because they hit that limit and all the fat starts going to their, visceral area to their organs, to their liver. Um, So they don't get as big, genetically speaking, in general, but they're about over 45% of the Chinese adults, adults in China are pre-diabetic. No, they're not bigger than us, but they're sicker. And their diabetes has been on the rise. So yeah, if you don't know Asia, yeah, once upon a time, maybe their main source of carbs was rice, primarily. They've been somewhat westernized. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, all the big food, <laughs> processed food, fast food companies have made their way in. Um, they're getting some sugar now. They're getting some sugar. They're getting some more refined carbohydrates, and they're eating it like crazy. They have not increased their protein intake, right? They have a low-protein higher carb diet, and they've replaced what was probably a very good starch like rice with um, refined, much more refined grains, refined carbohydrates. So next thing to avoid, trans fats, which we all know that, right? We all, everybody agrees. It's one thing everybody agrees on. Trans fats, bad, right? Uh, which is the, the fats have been made saturated chemically. 
I'm all for naturally occurring saturated fats faster than made saturated for it by adding the hydrogen. Uh, no, stay away. Uh, and vegetable oils, seed oils, like I mentioned before, they're very, like I said, they're omega-6, they're very inflammatory. They're the opposite of the omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory. Um, they're, they're unstable because they're missing, they have open, what we call double bonds, but they have open bonds to allow um, oxygenation and oxygen molecule to attach. And it's, it's like rust, think of it that way. So it's, it's, it's age, it creates um, free radicals in our body, what runs around and just, it's just oxidizing. Okay. It's oxidizing from the minute it's made. So if you have an omega-6 fat, but it's still in the nut or the seed, that it's you know still in the almond, it's still in the walnut, it's still in the sunflower seed, that's not the same as having an oil that's been extracted, an omega-6 oil extracted from canola or something like that, where it immediately begins to oxidize the time it's left that food in the process, just the processing of it. Um, it's safe when it's still within a food. Like a, like a food that's supposed to have fat, right? Like a nut or a seed. But it's not, once it leaves that corn, soy, you know, byproduct process, um, canola from rapeseed, uh, you know, rice bran, oil, another one. Uh, stay away from those. They're rancid, they're oxidizing minute go, and you cook with them, and it just makes it even Worse, they're PUFAs, or so polyunsaturated fatty acid, which they're we're told that's heart healthy, it's good for us, it's not saturated. Okay, so in case you haven't heard the saturated fat thing, it's there's no there's no controlled clinical study to show that saturated fat is bad for you. There's actually one in Japan that showed us it was protective. Saturated fat was protective of stroke. Um, but there's plenty of evidence showing that the omega sixes omega-6 oils, the linoleic acids, are anti, <coughs> excuse me, anti-inflammatory, or are inflam in, very inflammatory. Um, and so uh, you want to use butter, coconut oil, olive oil is resistant. It's mono, olive oil and avocado are much more resistant because they're monounsaturated, so they don't have so many open chains for that oxygen molecules in there, just one instead of poly, which is many. Um, and they're a little more heat resistant, olive oil is, but I would still use it at a lower heat. But I personally cook with, cook with lard, um, tallow, butter, you can use duck fat, um, but they're, they're stable on the shelf. They're not gonna continue to oxidize um, like those poofas do in the jar, in the bottle, wherever you have it. Uh, they're much more heat resistant. So even under heat, you cook with them, they're not gonna oxidize as much either. They're very resistant. Um, so go with, Go with the saturated fats for uh, cooking. Um, here's a very unpopular one before here, alcohol. Alcohol is processed a lot like fructose. Some of it goes to the brain, obviously, right? We all know that. That's why we drink it. That's why we like it so much. The feeling it gives us, um, how it affects our brain. But most of it ends up, again, at the liver. It can be processed in the muscles. It's going to go to the liver, convert it to fat, um, and, uh, and it kind of drives that visceral fat buildup, which again is going to create the insulin resistance. So if you're trying to lose weight and you're having a drink or two every night, you're, that's going to impair your weight loss. If you're frustrated with what's going on, it's, it's probably the alcohol. You're doing a, you can do everything else right. If you're still having a couple of drinks a night, that's going to at, at least slow things down to half or a quarter of what you could be losing. Um, and it might stop it altogether. And I've seen that time again. Um, you're best to abstain from it while you're trying to lose weight. Just don't have it. If you must have it, I have found that. Now, it may be different, a little different for you, but across the board with clients that I've worked with, two drinks a week is manageable. They can still lose weight at a fairly good pace and have two drinks a week. So that's one drink on two nights or two drinks on one night, but that's it. That's about it. Beyond that, I can't tell you that it's gonna help you. And even that, that for some people, that may be, might stand in their way depending on how insulin resistant they are. But generally speaking, most people I've found can get away with two drinks a week. Again, best not to have 
any at all until you get to where your goal weight is or close to it and then figure out what you can do to keep you from gaining weight and maintain because it is going to have an effect on your liver and your liver's ability, not just the fat that it stores because that's what happens when you drink it, but on its ability to manage all these hormones, manage your insulin sensitivity. Uh, it's going to pump out more triglycerides, right? When you're drinking alcohol, it's going to, where do I put this stuff? Convert to fat, pump in triglycerides, send your body. So send fat, fat molecules into your bloodstream to be stored, okay? Unless you're running while you're drinking, right? You're going you're gonna to store it. Um, so uh, you're better off avoiding it altogether. Another big one, which has probably affected a lot of people in this last year, uh, just because of our, our schedules being so jacked up, uh, is a lack of sleep, which can increase your insulin levels, cortisol levels, cortisol will release. If cortisol levels are high, you're going to release more blood sugar. And that if you're not using it, if you're just stressed out or just elevated cortisol and you're walking around, you're not running from something, you're at something, um, you're going to raise your blood sugar and you're going to end up storing that as fat because you don't really need it. You're not working out. Um, it can increase ghrelin, which is a hunger hormone, which is going to drive some cravings. And, it, and they've, they've shown this with, with blood work, few, uh, like a few, like three, four nights of less than six hours of sleep, let's say four to five hours of sleep, will put you in a, at a pre-diabetic level, your blood work, okay? You're not stuck there. You're not technically pre-diabetic, but your body thinks it is. It acting like it from your, if you look at your blood work and your hormones, um, you'll be in a pre-diabetic, in other words, elevated blood sugar, elevated triglycerides. It's not good. So you're basically, you're increasing your fat storage. You got low energy because you're, one, you're tired and two, you're, you're insulin resistant. You're not, you're not going to be accessing, your insulin's high, so you're not going to be insulin, uh, accessing fat for fuel. So between meals, you're going to get hungry more often, right? So increased fat storage, low energy, you're more hungry. It's not fun. You're not going to be fun. Nobody's going to be around you. You're going to be probably a little grumpy, but hungry for sure. And you're going to be craving all, because you're not able to access body fat, you're going to be craving high energy food. So all of the worst foods possible, the ones we talked about earlier, where they're a combination of carbs and fat together, the pizza, the ice cream, the donuts, all going to look really good to you because you want as much, much energy in as possible. It's a pretty bad cycle. So just try to get at least six hours of sleep, ideally seven to eight as often as you can. Um, yeah, but, you know, I think starting out here, give you some, some, some steps, get a baseline, figure out where you are right now, especially if it's a concern, if you're trying to lose weight or if you, you're struggling to lose weight, you're hitting some, some roadblocks, get a blood test, check your fasting insulin, see where you are on that scale. And if you're in the teens or you're in really over 10, over eight, honestly, um, work on getting it down, you know, avoiding the sugar, avoiding the alcohol, um, avoiding mixing carbs and fats together. Uh, so, um, you know, start with that, get you, and while you're getting the fast insulin, go ahead and get your, you know, triglycerides, your standard blood test, basically with the blood glucose or A1C, um, triglycerides and, and everything, and just know your numbers, you know, get a body comp if you have that available, um, find out what your body composition is, not just your weight, but your, your, your ratio, your, your fat, per, body fat percentage to lean mass and know what that is. So you have a goal, you know, where you're starting, you have a goal. I want to get to you know, 15% body fat or 12% body fat, whatever that is for you. And I'll get my fasting insulin down to a healthy level between three and eight. Those, if you just did those two things, everything else would really follow. But it's your lifestyle, it's the choices you make that are going to get you there. So you want less frequent eating. The less often you eat, uh, the less your insulin levels are going to be elevated and your blood sugar is going to, you know, less your blood sugar is going to be elevated. So two or three meals a day no snacks. Now that can vary with activity level. Uh, as far as two or three meals, if you're working out, you just you want a meal afterwards with some protein. You know, that's your choice. I, I, have, I have clients who work out first thing in the morning, they don't eat till noon. And their goal is weight loss, and that works. Um, but, you know, two or three meals a day, no snacking, let insulin come down. And that's the intermittent fasting, of course, where you compress your meals into a six or eight hour period of the day, let's say between 12 and eight or uh, 12 and six or one and seven, you know, that, that, that would work. If that seems foreign or scary to you, start with three meals, no snacking, and then try find, you know, three days a week 
where you do, maybe it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where you just skip breakfast, you have coffee or maybe coffee with a tablespoon of cream. That's it. You don't eat till lunch and then lunch and dinner. That's it. Okay. But try to, you know, start with three meals when you get that down. That's easy or that's normal. Then go to two meals on two or three days a week and then eventually work up to five or six if you can. Uh, prioritize protein every meal. That's, if you're eating one thing, it better be protein. Okay. If you're going to eat it all, it better be, better start with a good amount of protein. Um, protein with naturally occurring fat is fine. We don't need to load up on fat or do extra fat if you're trying to lose weight and improve because you're already insulin resistant. Um, you're not burning fat too well just yet. So a lot of the fat that you eat is going to be stored as fat. So again, if it's naturally occurring, it's just in the meat, fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but go with, you know, whole eggs, beef, chicken, pork, fish, all that's great. Um, you know, put, if you eat vegetables, you want to put some butter in your veggies or olive oil in your salad. That's fine. Um, but don't feel like you got to eat excessive amounts of, oh, I better eat more fat. No, eat more protein whenever you can. Um, but, you know, you're a good goal. And I've, and this is not something I made up. This is like from the studies I've shared in previous shows and from previous guests I've had on registered dietitians like uh, Diana Rogers, uh, Michelle Hearn, um, registered dietitians. And, and they recommend, you know, a goal of one gram of protein per pound of body weight. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, good evidence out there from, you know, depending on your weight and what your goal weight is, 0.8 uh, grams to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So for you um, outside the US, that'd be anywhere from 1.8 to 2.2 grams of protein per pound or per kilo of body weight, okay? Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I probably messed that one up. Let's just keep it simple. Um, converting all that, but it, it's one to one. So it's two, if it's 2.2 grams per kilo, that's like one gram per pound. Okay. Let's keep it simple like that. I don't want to mess that up too much. Um, but, and, and if you, if you're hitting just under that, like a 1.8 grams per kilo, you're good. You're good. That's fine. You're, you're better than 90% of the people out there. Uh, you're doing better with that, but start, you know, start by hitting, if that seems a lot, try to hit hundred grams per day. So that's like a pound of meat. Okay. Figure a six ounce or six, uh, six grams per ounce of meat or six grams of protein per whole egg. It's a good way to go. So if you're having um, 12 ounces of, of meat and you're having, um, you know, three, four, four eggs, you're pretty good. You're pretty good. Um, and then if you can digest vegetables, vegetables don't bother you. Definitely have vegetables alongside them, eat them. Uh, just avoid the starchy stuff, avoid starchy carbs and sugars, right? Um, if you're gonna do a breakfast, try to make it protein. And if, you're, and if your goal is to do intermittent fasting, you know, maybe make as small a breakfast as possible. So it's one or two eggs because you're gonna get used to, you're trying to get used to moving away from it if, when that's your goal. If this is very new to you and you're used to eating four or five times a day, Let's have a nice big protein breakfast. Go ahead and have three, four eggs or some meat with that, two eggs and some meat. Um, just to make sure you're not getting hungry and you let everything settle down. Let your hormones, your metabolic hormones settle back down and get you used to eating um, protein and, and fewer meals, right? Because that will be very satisfying. The more protein you eat, the less hungry you're going to be, the, less, the more your cravings are going to go away. You're going to come down and the more satisfied you're going to be with, with what you've eaten. Um, Lunch, 40 or 50 grams of, of uh, protein would be ideal. So that's eight to 10 ounces of meat, um, you know, based on your size. If you're a hundred pound female, chances are you probably don't need to lose weight. And eight to 10 ounces of meat is going to be a lot for you. You're probably more in the six ounce range. But your average person who's maybe weighs 150 to, I don't know, 250 pounds and you want to lose weight, eight to 10 ounces of meat, about right for you. With some, again, some veggies on the side, use olive oil or butter, that's fine. Ghee, great. Um, Dinner, again, 40 or 50 grams of protein, again, with the veggies. And as a caveat, you know, just um, if you want to have some starch that may feel like, okay, I've given up sugar, starch, this is, this is tough to get you through a serving of starch at dinner only. Um, there's about 30 grams of net carb, could be about three quarters of a cup or a cup of, depending on what you're eating, whether it's a rice or a quinoa or a pasta, whatever it is you decide to have, 
just limit the amount. And if you're hungry, you load up on the veggies and the, the protein, right? But you don't really need those carbs. So if you can skip, once you get used to that, skip um, as your next level of progression, skip that serving of starch. Maybe you only skip that serving of starch two or three days a week. And then three or four days a week, you do have that serving of starch or whatever ratio you want to do, but just know you don't need that starch. Your body can create all the glucose it needs in your liver. Your liver creates all the glucose you need. Um, it will convert the protein you're eating into glucose as needed. Okay. It will convert the protein or muscle, if you don't eat enough protein, into glucose as needed. So if you don't eat the sugar and you don't have much fat to burn, or you don't, the fat isn't breaking down quickly enough, it will break the protein down and at a rate, at a level or rate that is not going to be spiking your insulin because it's only going to break it down to meet your energy needs. So if you're working out, yeah, it's going to break down more and release more glucose or glycogen from the, uh, from the protein. But if you're just kind of hanging out and just cruising or just doing your chores or doing your, you know, your errands or working at your desk, you're not going to have a sudden burst of glucose from eating protein. You will from eating glucose, you will from eating a starch or sugar, you will have that and it will block fat burning, but your body's not going to break down protein and turn to glucose if it doesn't need the energy. So it's very tightly regulated amount as opposed to what you eat. It, it's all going in. It's all going to hit in your bloodstream, isn't it? If you eat it, it's all going in. If you don't eat it and your body has to break down protein to make it, it's much more regulated at a level that your body needs for its energy requirements. Do you see the difference? That's going to allow you to burn fat much more efficiently. It's going to allow those, those hormones, those metabolic hormones like insulin and the hunger hormone ghrelin to come back down to normal and to start playing well together. So leptin is released from your fat cells and you can say, oh, I feel satisfied as opposed to when you're insulin resistant you might have a lot of leptin out but you're resistant to it you don't notice it so you don't so you don't feel full you don't feel content or satisfied with what you've eaten you're still hungry all the time even though you've got more than enough stored energy on your body to get you through don't you well you need again limit your alcohol to two drinks a week get at least six hours of sleep if not seven or eight shoot for seven to eight hours of sleep uh, and just get your diet in place. Get your diet in place first. If you're not exercising, hear me. I'm going to say it again. Get your diet in place first. If you're already exercising, keep doing what you're doing. Adjust your diet. Do not change your diet to meet your exercise needs. Do not change your diet to meet your exercise needs right now, unless it's increasing protein. Okay. But don't eat more carbs in order to help you perform better in your workout. Your goal is weight loss. You are not training for a sport. Or at least that's such, if you want to do it, that's great. A sport, that's fine. Lose weight. We're losing weight. That's your number one goal. If you're talking to me right now about this, the goal is weight loss. The goal is improving insulin sensitivity, is reversing insulin resistance. Maybe you're diet, type 2 diabetic and you want to reverse your type 2 diabetes or get off your metformin, get off your medications. You can do that like this, do not feed your workouts carbs so you can perform better. Hear me? Well, you have to be consistent with this. There are no cheat days. Occasionally a meal might is gonna happen anyway that is not ideal for the plan. Those are gonna happen. Your goal is weight loss, insulin sensitivity, improved insulin sensitivity, bring those hormones back down, burn off fat around your liver. Okay, um, this is good food. It's very sustainable food. Uh, you don't need cheat days, okay? You're not eating cardboard. We're not eating rice cakes with, with like peanut butter spread on them. This is not the 80s, okay? We're eating meat, we're eating whole eggs, we're eating some vegetables if you tolerate them, if you digest them well. Pork, beef, chicken, fish. Enjoy, enjoy those. Um, but if your insulin levels are high, it's going to take time for those to come back down. Give, allow it time. Allow the insulin resistance time to reverse. Um, it, for some, it could be a week. Some could be a few weeks before you really start seeing weight loss or something changing on the scale. You might probably notice some water loss initially from the uh, carb reduction. Um, 
but it, it the weight loss may not be consistent. It may be very stop start, you know, stair steppy. You drop a little, you stick. You drop a little, you stick for a while until that insulin. It may always stay that way, but it, you, you allow time for the hormone. You've you've got you've been probably if if you're insulin resistant. You've been eating this way, living this way in a way that created insulin resistance for a while now. Give yourself a month or two, if necessary, on a good plan, be consistent with it to allow weight loss to take effect. Now, I, I think I got ahead of myself a little bit. You can add in exercise once you get in diet of place. Okay. Um, three times a week, go for strength training. Um, and then if you want to add some cardio, you can, but prioritize strength training because it is much more, it has much more of an improvement on insulin sensitivity of the muscle and you get those muscles active and burning off the glycogen in them because that's a great deposit for blood sugar. So your blood sugar levels come down. You want to add some cardio, whether it's high intensity interval training or steady state, I don't care. Do what works best for you. Do what you can tolerate. Do what you will be most consistent with, but definitely get the strength training in as a priority. I say at least three times a week. Okay. A little exercise, a little cardio afterwards to bring down blood sugar or do it later in the day, go for a walk, bring down blood sugar, anything you do to bring down blood sugar, it's great. But the weight training improves your insulin sensitivity at the muscle, allowing you a place to put those glycogen, the glucose, instead of turning into fat, storing a fat cell, you can store this glycogen in a muscle. Okay, most of your glucose can be burned up in your muscle, like 80% of it. So that's what you want, but you gotta get those muscles active and give them a reason to shuttle that fuel to those muscles. You gotta give them a reason. You gotta work them, you gotta use them. Um, again, no cheat days, but we're not fueling the workouts with carbs to have better workouts right now. That's not what we're doing. Your goal is insulin sensitivity. Keep that forefront. Um, and again, give yourself some time, give your body some time to adjust. Um, consistent, the consistent habits will change the metabolic hormones to allow you to start burning fat much more consistently and effectively. Um, again, if you're type two diabetic, and this is how people are reversing type two diabetes all over the world by the tens of thousands. I mean, Jason Fung and his fasting method has, has reversed type two diabetes for the last 10 years for probably 14, 15,000 people, okay? Uh, Sarah Hallberg at the uh, University of Indiana has like the, one of the leading uh, weight loss um, clinics in, in the country, uh, if not the world. And they're reversing type two, two, type two diabetes as well. Her advice, ignore the guidelines they are doing keto, right? Um, and I know docs all over the country now from, from this podcast, I've had them on. They're helping people reverse type two diabetes with low carb or intermittent fasting or both put together. This is how you do it. You can get off your meds. You can have normal blood sugar levels. You can restore um, normal insulin levels. Um, so set yourself up to succeed, okay? Know that you can do it. Set yourself up to succeed. Put a system in place for your meals or get a schedule together for your meals, your workouts, your sleep, and stick to it. Remove the temptations. Get rid of the food that doesn't need to be there that you know is going to throw you off. The whole concept of willpower, I just said more willpower, that's, 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 it doesn't exist. It's non-existent, okay? That's a reason, I mean, it, it's about putting, your, setting yourself up to succeed means getting rid of the pitfalls that could ensnare you when you have a weak moment. We all have weak moments. We all have moments when we're tired, we're frustrated, we're fatigued mentally. And if something is there to comfort us, we're gonna, we're gonna go after it. We're gonna get it. Remove them, remove the cookies, remove the chips, remove the snack food, get the, get the ice cream out, get the sugary drinks out, put the alcohol somewhere else where you're not gonna see it, put it where you have to you know, unlock something to get to it or put it where we, you can't see it at all. Set yourself up to succeed. Create a schedule for yourself, for the meals, for the workouts, for your sleep, bedtimes, that you can stick to, to so that you can succeed. Give yourself a map, give yourself a plan to follow. Because if you have to make the decision every time in the moment, you're gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna be that successful. Nobody is. Whether you're starting a business um, or starting a, a workout plan or a, or a diet plan, you're, you, you have to have a plan. 
You have to know what your boundaries are. You have to know what your focus is. And you set yourself up to be, treat it like a job, treat it like your business. You got to be at work on time. You have so many hours to put in. You know what your tasks are. You have to focus on. If you don't do those tasks or you start doing other tasks that aren't, don't help those tasks, you're not going to get your job done. Your business won't succeed. Treat this with the same respect. It's your health. It's your body. It's, it, it determines how long you're on this life, on this planet, with your life to make an impact, right? Treat it with respect. Set yourself up to succeed. Do not rely on your willpower in the moment. You will have enough opportunities like that, but most of the time, most of your day, most days need to go like clockwork. Need to be pre-planned, set in place, set yourself up, meals made ahead of time if necessary. Put it on your calendar. This is what I'm working out. This is what I'm eating. This is what I'm going to bed. So you need less willpower, less discipline to succeed you just follow your calendar you just follow your schedule you can do it talk to you later